American whiskey. Uh, there's a pretty broad spectrum, but of course there are some more there are some more important members of the family and some you know less uh, less popular members of the of the American whiskey family. But what is American whiskey? Well, American whiskey is a whiskey. So same idea that ties all the whiskeys. It's made of cereal grains uh, aged in wood. So how do, how do American whiskeys uh, deal with this? Well, there are five major styles of American whiskey. There's corn whiskey, which is 80% corn in the mash bill. We'll get to what a mash bill is in a second. Uh, there is wheat, rye, and uh, barley whiskey, and all of those are 51% or greater rye in the mash bill. And then of course, there's the granddaddy of them all, which is bourbon, which is 51% corn. Now, if that sounds a little odd, why would you have two that are corn? Is that corn whiskey by itself, their laws are very different from all of the other whiskeys. Corn whiskey is 80% or more corn in the mash bill. And if it's aged in wood, it has to be neutral oak and or oak that's been treated uh, to make sure that it doesn't impart any flavor. So as opposed to all the other American whiskeys, which are 51% or greater of the aforementioned cereal grain in the mash bill, they're also uh, all aged in first time charred new American oak. And most distillers will tell you that that charred new oak gives the, the resultant whiskey 65, 75% of its flavor. So clearly it's a very, that corn whiskey is a very unique product in the American whiskey canon and not a very popular one. So I'm not gonna spend any more time talking about it, but let's talk about the other ones. There's, corn, there's um, barley, which can be 51% or greater in the mash bill. Now, common practice is if you call, you call barley whiskey malt whiskey because you're using malted barley. Uh, and that's the same as in Europe when you say it's a malt whiskey, you mean you're making it with, with, with barley. However, the difference in America is that to call it a barley whiskey or a malt whiskey, it only has to be 51% or greater uh, barley malt in the mash bill. However, practice, uh, assumed practice, is to use 100% barley in the mash bill if you're calling it a single malt whiskey. Kind of taking their, their cue from, from uh, Scotland, Ireland. But there's no law, that's common practice, there's no law saying they have to. So it's one of those things where in America you kind of have to know who's making your whiskey to really know what they're doing. So that's barley. And it's in a more and more important category as more and more folks especially are, are leaning into American single malt whiskeys. So something to look out and it's certainly gaining in popularity, but it's not where bourbon or rye are yet. So then of course, there's wheat whiskey. There's only a few wheat whiskeys on the market. There's one that's local here in the Triangle, but most famously uh, there's a Burnham, which is also made by the fine folks at Heaven Hill and only because I believe Heaven Hill wants to have one of all of the styles of whiskey. So they have that, and it's not a terribly important category, um, but it does exist. Wheat whiskey, it's 51% or greater wheat in the mash bill. Traditionally, in America, if a, if a whiskey is 51% or greater something in the mash bill, the makeup is probably, especially if you're making the, that whiskey in the South, you're gonna use mostly corn to make up the difference and some barley on top to make the magic happen as far as the transformation of, 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 of starches to sugars and such. It just helps in the mash bill. But corn is the kind of, kind of is the filler grain in the mash bill for most American whiskeys. It gives us a round, soft, broad shoulder sweetness to, the, uh, to all those styles of whiskey. And then of course there's rye whiskey, which 51% or greater rye in the mash bill. All these northern expressions of rye or Monongahela Valley style ryes have a lot more mash, uh, rye in the mash bill. You, you'll even see some of these newer ones claiming 100% rye, which is not a traditional kind of possibility even because that barley was always really important to kind of help with the fermentation process. Um, but now with, with commercialized yeast strains, you can always just dump that in and now you have 100% rye whiskeys. Um, but the southern style ryes, the ryes made by folks in Kentucky, are closer to 51% rye, with the bulk of what's left over being corn and maybe some barley. So what you end up with the south, the southern style ryes you get uh, are a little broader shouldered, rounder, softer, mellower, 
and the um, 95.5 blends uh, of rye or 100% rye blends are gonna be a lot leaner. Uh, rye, as opposed to uh, the other grains, tends to be grassier, tends to be spicier. So that's kind of the rye notes you're looking for. Um, and then last but not least, of course, there's bourbon, which is 51% or greater corn in the mash bill. It can't be more than 75% corn, I don't believe, in the mash bill. So clearly the idea of having a more complex mash bill is central to the idea of bourbon uh, and what it is as opposed to, say, the corn whiskey we spoke about earlier. So 51% or greater rye in the, uh, excuse me, corn in the mash bill for bourbon. And then it's usually around the 65, 70 amount. And then there's, there's usually, historically, there's rye and there's barley. Rye for the, for the spice note, because corn gives this round, soft sweetness, but rye gives the, the bourbon a little bit of pepper and some, some herbaceous grassy notes. And then barley, which can lend a cocoa note, but it's really soft note and it's not a dominant flavor thing. Barley is really there to help the fermentation process, especially if you're co-fermenting, meaning you're fermenting all of your grains in the same mash. When I said I'd talk about mash bill, that's what I mean. The mash bill is the, is the recipe of cereal grains that you're fermenting together to get your mash, to get your low alcohol solution that you will turn around and distill into your spirit. So the way you make up your mash bill leads to the kind of the first building block of flavor. And so let's talk about like what rules apply to all those American whiskeys besides the corn, besides the corn whiskey. They have to be 51% or greater of the named uh, grain. So if it's a rye whiskey, 51% or greater rye in the mash bill. If it's a wheat whiskey, 51% or greater wheat. Uh, and if it's a malt whiskey, 50% or greater malted barley. So 51% or greater corn and bourbon. So that's the first tier that all of those, those four American whiskeys share. They all have to be aged in first time, uh, charred American oak barrels. That's important. Um, and if you say they all have to be made in America to be, to be called an American version, even uh, bourbon has to be made 100% in America. Uh, and then they have to be, uh, pardon me, and, and any of the, the legal ease that's on them, the legally defined words, the terms of art, as the legal folks would say, uh, on them has to have to uphold that law. So to say straight, you'll often see the word straight. What does this say? This says uh, Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey, right? Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey. Well, for that to be on the label, it has to be made in Kentucky. You can make straight bourbon whiskey anywhere else in America, but, but in no other country. But you just can't say Kentucky unless you're actually made in Kentucky. So straight means two years or older. Bourbon, as I've said before, 51% or greater corn in the mash bill. First time charred a new American oak. If it's aged less than four years, it has to explicitly state the age of the whiskey on the bottle. So the word straight means at least two years. Uh, anything less than four years, you have to expressly, expressly state the age of the whiskey on the bottle. So most whiskey is aged north of four years. Um, and it says straight bourbon whiskey. And of course, whiskey meaning cereal grains, as we've talked about, aged in wood. So those are those. Now there's one step higher than all of those American whiskeys, plus some other spirits, uh, famously um, Applejack, uh, but almost any spirit made in America can also fall under the Bottle in Bond Act of 1897. This particular example right here of Old Forester 1897, named after the Bottle in Bond Act, is Bottled in Bond. Now, Bottled in Bond uh, has a few more, is just a few more legal hurdles. The whiskey all had to be stored in a federally inspected uh, warehouse. Well, now every distillery in America has a federally inspected warehouse, so that's not as hard. Uh, but all has to be made by the same distiller. Everything in this bottle has to be, have, have, have been made by the same distiller. All of the barley has to, all of this distillation has to be from the same distilling season. There are two seasons in the year. There's the first half of the year and the second half of the year. So all of the juice from this bottle has to be from the same year and in that year, the same season, the same half of the year, um, it all has to be bottled at 100 American proof. So those are like the important parts of the Bottled and Bond Act. And that was to ensure quality. You weren't gonna get a watered down whiskey, it was gonna be bottled right at 100 proof. Um, you weren't gonna get anybody, or they weren't buying different, uh, sourcing different bourbons, they had to make it, they had to make it, one distiller had to make it. And then they had to bottle it 
it had to be at least four years old. So you knew you were going to get a, a, if you bought a bottled and bond whiskey, you knew, or a bottled and bond Applejack, uh, you knew you were going to get a quality product that was at least four years old, at least 100 proof, things you could depend on. Uh, so that was basically, I believe, the first uh, Consumer Protection Act ever for America, uh, or, you know, was, was w the way we treated our whiskey in 1897. But it, like I said, it's not just bourbon, which uses it the most. Rye whiskeys like this old Overholt bonded or the Rittenhouse bonded, uh, rye whiskeys can do it. Laird's Applejack has a, has famously has a bonded version of their Applejack, also at 100 proof, also four years old. So that's bottled in bond. Now, we have all of these different American whiskeys, uh, but the two clearly that are the most important are bourbon and rye. And rye kind of went away after prohibition. It lost its luster. It had been continued to be made in very, very small amounts, but it has come back and charged hard, uh, especially with the advent of the renaissance of cocktails, because there were all these cocktails that were rye cocktails. So all of a sudden, there was market demand. So these distilleries that made a little rye started making more rye. And these distilleries that had never existed before said, hey, we should start making rye whiskey. It's very popular. So those have come back, and we'll talk about how to use those uh, later, but rye whiskey is very important and they fall under all those American whiskey laws. Bourbon, there's a few more things we kind of need to talk about when we talk about bourbon. Um, first of all, all of the American whiskeys have this first time, one use only charred barrel thing. Well, that has two things. It A, makes it expensive because you have to buy the barrel and then you're done with it after you use it once, right? Well. That's very helpful to folks in Scotland, in all of the rum producing areas, in tequila producing areas. If you'll look at now, you look at, at barrels of tequila, you'll see some of them are even name checking the bourbons, the bourbon barrels that were used before to make their tequila. So the, the, what, do, what do these distilleries do with these barrels? There is an ocean of them. They send them to Ireland to age Irish whiskey, to Scotland to age, to age Scotch, whis Scotch whiskey, to Mexico to age tequila, all over the Caribbean uh, to age rum in. And beer drinkers will know bourbon, aged, bourbon barrel aged beer is quite the thing. Well, it beca it's because they can only use the barrel once. So they have to do something to monetize that barrel. And thank God, because there's still good flavor in it, but because the folks in 18, because the folks who were defining American whiskey said, we really want to ensure this char is an expression of American oak, they legally defined it as you could only use it once. So that's an important thing to understand why American whiskey tastes very different often than other whiskeys from around the world. Um, a few other things to know about bourbon whiskey that's important uh, are the distilling regulations. You cannot distill a bourbon whiskey higher than 160 uh, proof or 80% or ethanol. Why is that? Well, the higher you, the cleaner you distill, the higher you dis distill, the cleaner the spirit is. Vodka, by law, has to be at least 190 coming off the still before you can call it vodka. Bourbon can't be north of, of 160. Why? Well, the more you distill, the cleaner it is, the less apparent the mash bill is on, on the end result spirit. And since bourbon is uh, bourbon is 51% or greater corn, and since uh, they, the, the mash bill is one of the key, one of the key cornerstones to a, a, a bourbon's flavor profile, they don't want you to lose that mash bill by, by, by cooking it too clean and just starting with clean ethanol. They want to know or to be able to suss out the underlying mash bill in the end. So can't be any hotter then 160 coming off the still, and most of them shoot for, I think, the 130s. It can't go into the barrel, which, as we know, it has to be barrel-aged, any higher than 125 or 62.5% uh, alcohol by volume. Why is that? Well, because they want to get as much flavor uh, on that whiskey. If it's all just heat, it will take might take the, the, the flavor on too fast. Uh, if it's too much, if it's too low, uh, we, you, you could also have issues. So 125 is that mark that it can't be any higher going into the barrel. Um, and then finally, you can't call it whiskey. And this is true with most spirits in America. You can't call it whiskey. You can't call it bourbon, certainly, if it's any lower than uh, 80 proof or 40% alcohol by volume uh, 
in whiskeys. And now the trend, of course, is for higher and higher whiskeys. So th all those things uh, are, are prevalent to bourbon. The last thing, and I said I'd talk a little bit more about mash bill, the last important thing to know about, um, not, this is not the last, there's plenty more to know about bourbon. But the last thing I want to talk about that's really important to know, especially about mash bill when you're talking bourbon, is there are three historic, three important styles of bourbon. There is a traditional mash bill, which is mostly corn with a little bit of rye for flavor. Uh, let's just think about salt and peppering, in this case peppering, uh, the mash bill with rye, and then a little bit of barley, and that's mostly for fermentation, right? So it's mostly corn, a little rye, and some barley, and that's in a traditional mash bill bourbon like these guys. Um, if you add a little more rye because you want a spicier, leaner bourbon, um, it's still a bourbon, it's not a rye, which is 51% or greater rye, it's still a bourbon. Um, you can go just a little higher on that rye whiskey, uh, the, the rye, sorry, the rye grain in your mash bill, and you get a spicier, leaner expression of bourbon like this Four Roses right here. If you want a softer, rounder uh, bourbon altogether, you can forsake the rye completely and replace it with wheat. And in that case, you get what is called a wheated bourbon, not a wheat whiskey a weeded bourbon, still mostly corn in the mash bill. So for softer expressions, uh, Larceny, uh, Makers famously makes a weeded bourbon, Pappy Van Winkle is famously a weeded bourbon, so that falls into the weeded category. Most of your bourbon whiskeys, and I, there are too many to mention, fall into the traditional mash bill range, uh, and there's quite a few popular ones, Bullet for, for point of reference, uh, Four Roses of course, are high rye. What is the legal definition of these, of these uh, regular uh, traditional mash bill and a high rye? What, what is the number, how, what percentage of rye goes, go, you go north of that in your high rye? It's up to you. Uh, it's, it basically comes down to practice and what you decide that you think is a high rye. So that's a characteristic and it's a style, it's something that you, you can claim, but it's really up to the individual distiller to say, 15 is or isn't high rye. No, 18 is the minimum for high rye. That's not a legally defined thing. It's a popular differentiating style or character that they, they claim, but it's not legally defined. So that's important to know when you're thinking about this. Uh, but when you're thinking about it, I hope you're doing it, your homework the right way by sipping it as well, because uh, tasting them is really the best way to discover the best things about American whiskey. How do we use American whiskey? Well. It depends how much you pay for that bottle. <laughs> Seriously though, uh, there is a, a greater and greater uh, number of new labels that are really on the high end of the category. And if you're gonna spend the kind of money or the customer is gonna spend the kind of money to, to really uh, splurge on a high-end bottle or a, high -end, a sip of, from a high-end bottle that we're serving them, uh, they're probably gonna wanna have that either neat by itself in a glass or on the rocks with ice. Uh, so either, Basically, they want to isolate it because just like we talked about with the other categories, once you add other things in, making a cocktail of various ingredients, you're kind of losing some of the nuance, the subtlety, which is what you're paying the, the greater expense for. Otherwise, you could just use a really quality mid-tier product in that category, in this category, whiskey, uh, to, to get to make a cocktail with. And that's usually what we lean on. Now, if a customer says, no, 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 I want that really, really high-end spirit in my cocktail, we're gonna say, of course, it's your money. I'll make you anything you want. But we're generally gonna to gravitate toward that middle tier of, of, of spirits we're proud of serving to make our cocktails with. Uh, so high-end, generally speaking, straighter on the rocks. In cocktails, we're gonna find really quality representations of that middle tier. Uh, how do we use these? Specifically, rye is kind of the dominant in the classic cocktail. There's so many classics with rye, and it's kind of what spurred the resurgence of this category is the popularity of rye cocktails. Once the cocktail renaissance started, people really wanted to find good rye whiskeys. So now we have a whole uh, plethora of them in the market. And how do we use them? Well, Manhattan started its life as a rye whiskey cocktail. Pretty much all those uh, Northeastern cocktails that had whiskey had rye whiskey because that was the whiskey they had. So a Manhattan originally, although you can make a delicious Manhattan out of bourbon, originally it is a rye whiskey cocktail. So those stirred Northeastern classics had those also in New Orleans. Once they ran out of um, 
in the mid 1800s, once they ran out of, of, of cognac, they switched to rye. So a Sazerac, a Vucre, these are all rye whiskey cocktails. So you can certainly use them in a plethora of those kinds of, of stirred, spirit forward uh, whiskey cocktails, but also in blinkers and scofflaws, uh, even in new classics like Final Ward. And then taking, standing on the shoulders of those classics, learning from like how those um, ratios work, rye whiskey really lends itself to kind of, kind of cutting through uh, in a lot of different applications. So rye whiskey is now the, a, lot, a lot of times, a lot of bartenders default whiskey to use in modern cocktails and new, new, uh, new inventions. Then bourbon, of course, bourbon was in less, was originally in less of those classic cocktails, but it is the default whiskey to use in a modern Manhattan. So a bourbon Manhattan, for some people think is, uh, is just dead wood, like you're repeating, of course it's bourbon, it's Manhattan. Although, as we know, Manhattan was originally a rye whiskey cocktail. So bourbon whiskey, you can use in those great, uh, for use in those spirit forward cocktails like Manhattans or Old Fashions. Uh, also in some classics like Boulevardiers or Brown Derbies. Clearly, with the wealth and the breadth of different expressions of bourbon, uh, even at that mid-tier level, it lends itself in very different ways to so many different cocktails that it is a go-to for many bartenders making up new cocktails to, to satisfy whiskey lovers' desire to try different cocktails out. So how do we use it? First of all, we lean on those classics and then we learn from those classics to kind of come up with new things to showcase uh, what we love about these whiskeys. That's how we use it. Corn whiskey. Corn whiskey historically was the whiskey Americans produced throughout the South, throughout the corn producing belt, before there was uh, bourbon, before it was a category. So corn whiskey, wheat whiskey, rye whiskey, bourbon whiskey, all have a lot of the same characters or rather the same legal definitions. This one is bottled in bond. We talked about that in relation to bourbon and rye. And the Bottled and Bond Act acts in the corn whiskey category the same way as it acts in the bourbon whiskey and, and the rye whiskey and the wheat whiskey and the malt whiskey categories. And that because it's bottle and bond, it has to be at least four years. It has to be from one growing season. Uh, all of those, the, the bottle and bond parameters hold. The difference between corn whiskey and the whiskey it most closely relates to, which is bourbon, uh, is there are two main differences. One is corn whiskey cannot be aged in a charred oak barrel, a charred new oak barrel like bourbon must be. So this has to either be used, be aged in a used oak barrel or some vessel that does not impart uh, that charred new oak flavor. And uh, namely, it can be put in concrete or stainless steel, or I believe in the old, in the laws, because it's from, the laws are from the 1890s, uh, it, you could be put in a, um, a barrel that was coated with a wax, something to prevent the flavor from getting to it. Now, like I said, you can put it in a used oak barrel, which will definitely provide some, some color uh, to, the, to the spirit, but you just can't, it can't be in a first time charred oak barrel like bourbon and rye uh, and wheat must be. The other thing is the percentage. Now bourbon, of course, is 51% or greater corn in the mash bill. Corn whiskey has to be 80% or greater in the mash bill, but that's not a huge difference in that most like this is a Heaven Hill product and Heaven Hill's normal bourbon mash bill is 78% corn. And then when they make this, it's 80% corn. So that mash bill designation is a real small part of it. The, the main part is how they age the products versus bourbon. And I think corn, corn whiskey is really important for folks that love bourbon, especially to at least get a feel for, because historically this is where it came from. This was the first stop on the evolutionary train that, you know, that, that bourbon kind of followed in the footsteps of. There's a few thoughts on corn whiskey. <laughs>